fairly informal. So I want to have this as a, a more of a discussion just to get um, an idea of who's in the audience and, and what I could possibly be focusing on to, to help you or add value. Uh, let me give an introduction, then I'll ask you know, who's in the audience and what the interests are. My background is uh, I'm a neurosurgeon out of Australia, uh, worked with a lot of technologies, in fact had uh, an interesting career in medical devices, uh, both as a physician and an entrepreneur, building companies, uh, one has gone public, and done a variety of things, um, and now I saw a change in the world where medical devices have become a fairly, uh, you know, I think, um, highly regulated environment which doesn't allow for very good penetration of technology into the service and delivery arena. So as a result of that I saw what was happening with health tech and, and consumer and shifted to create uh, Dauphin Health uh, which we've created a platform called PingMD which I'm focused on in pediatrics. So the background is as a physician, as an innovator, um, more recently as investment banker, uh, I've seen the realm of finance and, and healthcare technology from a practitioner all the way through to how things uh, get uh, money behind them, how ideas uh, come to fruition, how you take them to market. And wanted to have a, really present this as a discussion of healthcare, um, which is a, a fairly complex topic, uh, but set a conversation where it can be relevant to things that you might be thinking of and, and things that you might be doing. Hey, Frank. Um, so just as a, a quick show, how many in the audience here are entrepreneurs? Want to start something, do a big deal, change the world, bright eyes, eyes in the headlights, that's great. Okay, so we're all here to, to change the world. That's, that's a great thing. So how many here have a healthcare background? How many of you do not have a healthcare background? Okay, so this is what, what I'm finding more and more about is that there are a lot of non-healthcare people who realize how archaic and arcane our, t our service delivery platforms are in healthcare who see that this is simple. This is like, as someone might say, shooting fish in a barrel uh, if we apply it. And then they get the experience of actually delivering care and health and realizing it's a complex environment, but an exciting and big opportunity. So. You know, when I, as I speak and go through some of these slides, it's really just to set the stage and, and please just interrupt, ask questions. Uh, if you're thinking about um, how does an innovation uh, get protected, you know, what's intellectual property about, how you actually create a team around building something innovative, what are, uh, you know, what I would see more recently exciting sectors, how do you get it financed, um, how do you actually put a team together, build it, get it to market, how do you talk to a customer? Scariest thing I found as a physician was selling to a physician. Uh, it's just, it's daunting. And every time I go out there, there's sweat on the brow. Yet another doctor to talk to, to convince to actually use a technology. Uh, but again, you know, it's, it's kind of understanding where does that emotion coming from? What's their anxiety? I mean, a customer is a customer. It's just that healthcare has some you know, various constraints that make it complicated in having a conversation and really trying to explain to them what your value prop is and then having a decision maker uh, actually act on that value prop. So by way of intro, I'm going to just put out a few slides. And do I do this from the panel or is there a remote? Just do it from here? I guess so, okay. So um, not that I want to stand behind a podium, but just to kind of set the scene of, of what I think healthcare uh, is becoming. So we all understand that healthcare has various problems. Um, a lot of us right now are focused in on the cost inefficiency of healthcare delivery. Uh, we're also looking at how healthcare is set up in, in a way that we may see in our current construct of service delivery uh, as somewhat perverse or complicated. And so as we look at this, we have to understand where it originated from, what we were actually delivering and where we might add value from a technological perspective. Um, the things with healthcare are you have various players in the market that uh, are not as easy to understand. It may be, uh, from an academic perspective, you could describe a payer. But from a physician perspective, when you send in you know, um, your bill for appropriate services, this is, you know, you're rolling the dice. I might get paid, I might get part of it, I might not get all of it. 
what is the complexity of actually convincing someone that you, uh, you, know, you delivered appropriate care and getting an appropriate fee for it? Within that fee construct, as, as an entrepreneur, you're trying to understand where the margin is. Where's the opportunity that I could bring value, either increase um, you know, uh, the capacity to pay or increase the throughput to generate revenue? Why does healthcare think of top line, not bottom line? You know? And the business of healthcare really is not natural to healthcare. It's a service platform. We've always been doing it and creating a system that was based on services. And so just to bring it into the realm of business has been a very complex uh, history and pathway. And we all know that the, you know, the provider is always there for us and we can rely on them. There we go. Uh, but the barriers to get access to your physician continue to increase. So the uh, the access to a doctor, the access to the hospital, the access to an expert opinion gets complicated. So real life scenario, I'm in uh, the emergency room with my son. He uh, trips downstairs at school, I get to pick him up, and I'm telling the school to take a picture of the injury, send it to me. They've got to locate a smartphone. This shocked me. Okay, so they locate a smartphone, take a picture of my son, I look at it and I say, call the OR, get them ready, he needs to have his hematoma of his ear drained. I know this. Son gets delivered to the emergency room. They're applying conservative management. They don't want to drain it. I apply my pressure and say, I need an ENT consult immediately. Call up my friends. The ENT surgeon comes down. They drain it. He's out of there. He gets his stitches out this morning. If you look at the complexity of care, without some kind of chaperone, without an advocate, without understanding of protocols, how does someone walk into a system and realize this is appropriate care or inappropriate care? These are the things that you, know, you look at it from the perspective of, you know, I go buy a car, there's transparency. I can learn what I need to learn to be able to buy that car. I can learn what I need to do to do any kind of finance trans transaction, but I can't go in there and decide protocols and weigh up research. Now, if you look at the research, so I go back to a technological solution, and say, okay, where do I find the data to say, here is a randomized controlled trial that says I should drain or not drain? Doesn't exist. But we know anecdotally, and, and the surgeons will tell you that, you know, cauliflower ear can get complicated, young child chondritis, et cetera, et cetera, and you go down the list. The risks are against you, so the appropriate management was to drain. But it's an opinion. It's not hard data. So when you build systems, statistical can, information can be really complicated in healthcare. And it's understanding that, that you start to realize that getting data, getting information, setting up a system, create a technological Im impact or intervention is not as easy as it might look or seem. So we're all set up for basically you know, um, a, an incentive system, a delivery system, uh, data access, you know, all of the, the, the information that we require to make decision processes set up in a way that you don't really get optimal care all the time. Now, ultimately, we have still probably the best healthcare in this country, and I'm saying this as a foreigner, uh, out of Australia, trained in you know, neurosurgery at, at some of the, the leading institutes outside of this country, uh, worked at Stanford, then at Seattle, and now at Duke. And I understand quality. This country delivers high quality care. So what's broken? It's really kind of system of we've broken it because we've just built a complex terrain. And so now we're trying to force fit solutions. We're not moving at speed. We're not able to impact. We're putting administrative tasks to people who should be actually in front of a patient. And so you look at all of these things and you say, this is just ripe and begging for a solution. And so the entrepreneur puts on their hat and puts on their starry-eyed glasses and says, I'm going at it. And, and it's not as easy a, a pathway as you might think. And I've done this again and again and again. And you wonder, you know, where's the inspiration? Well, the inspiration is that there's always going to be change. And I think now that I see healthcare motivated, some of it, you know, I think we can give credit to uh, political backgrounds and and the awareness that we've created in society and the education through the political process of what the issues are. 
Uh, but the other is, is that the environment somehow, is this kind of the perfect storm where, you know, economy falling, healthcare suffering, politics not answering everything, that we all of a sudden see talent just push into an environment where they have to be entrepreneurs. Uh, and these entrepreneurs know how to solve problems. The question is, can they get those solutions to market is another lift. That's, that's another skill set that, that you know, one has to develop beyond just being innovative. So why did I get excited? I got excited because healthcare is meeting technology yet again. Uh, hybrid solutions are being created. We, we can build something new here. We don't know what it looks like. Uh, but it's going to be interesting. And, and we need to really understand um, how that technology integrates into a healthcare solution. It's always complicated. You know, we're comparing our healthcare environment to business environments, and we're saying, what can we learn? What can we learn from Facebook? What can we learn from Twitter? What can we learn from Salesforce? What can we learn from, and the list goes on. Uh, and all of these successes, all of these uh, you know, consumer impacts that we've seen in the recent uh, past do have lessons to be learned, but they're not directly applicable to healthcare. And again, you know, I point back to the fact that you know, a lot of things that we see in healthcare uh, have the complexity of constraints that until you understand them, you're not sure whether you should move in them or around them. Ultimately, you know, how does innovation win? Uh, stay focused. It's got to be simple. It's got to explain itself. Um, it shouldn't be divergent. Uh, there are too many business plans and opportunities I see that are panaceas. I'm going to cure the world. And it cure the world off, and the list goes from cancer to cardiac to, to whatever it is. Those panaceas never come to market. Simple, exact, uh, very specific solutions come to market and make an impact. And so when you look at innovation, it really is that simple. If you can put it on the back of a napkin, I'll go back to uh, when I started Dorfan Health, complicated name, but there's a story behind it. Um, uh, we created PingMD, and so the platform had to be articulated in one line, less than one paragraph. If I couldn't understand it, I wasn't going to be able to explain it, I wasn't going to be able to convince anybody. So make it simple. Make sure that you can draw it with a single diagram, you understand who you're selling to, and you can explain it to yourself, and it's convincing enough that you can be passionate about it. And it's the passion that comes that, that I think is created by focus. You start to realize that you've got something and you've got your finger on the right pulse. Too many times you know, I think people enter healthcare and they say, okay, I'm going to do an end run. You know, I'm going to get around the constraints. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. I can get around this. Uh, you can't. Um, it, it is a very regulated, for appropriate reasons, environment. And it really is, acts as an advocate. The unfortunate side of that is with a lot of these, um, you know, let's call them uh, overseeing bodies have, I think, overstepped their uh, purview in a sense. They've overstepped what their responsibilities are, they're overstretching uh, their domain and what they're about to control. But there's hope. So where, are, where do entre entrepreneurs lie in this? Uh, you really, again, it's kind of like, you know, take the passion. Uh, seek the change, make a difference. And uh, this is your classic entrepreneur with the, the basic equipment ready to go at it. Um, and the one thing that I've learned, actually there's two, let me take the one back. The most important thing I've learned is this, is to target the goal and focus. It's really just endurance. This is really about, uh, it's, you know, people make the analogy of running a marathon, uh, you know, creating things and, and just making sure that you can get through it. It's more than that. It's passionate focus. It's more than just endurance. It's really getting the ball to where it needs to get to. The second thing is it's about people, not healthcare, business. Business is about connecting. It's about conversing. It's about creating relationships. That's the way you create change. Th those are probably the two most important lessons I've learned, other than maybe something like, you know, if she's rich, say yes. Money is a difficult thing to come by, so you really have to understand how to convince people to be able to fund you, 
so you can actually build what you think is innovative. So that's my little five minute. Here's healthcare. It's exciting. It's daunting. It's possible. Um, I think you know there are experiences from where I've been a, an entrepreneur and understood how to build a team, how to create a product, how to take it to market, and really understanding where it applies. You know what that value proposition is. Who is your customer? Uh, you know I found that I'm focusing on an innovation, and as you focus that innovation, your product becomes more clear. Then all of a sudden, it starts to dawn on you the value you're creating to a customer. Then you latch on to your customer, and you focus on that customer. Then you understand their pocket. Then you focus on their pocket, and you understand exactly where that money's coming from. And then you start to, and you can see how focus, 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 focus. It doesn't mean narrow your product. It means getting a deeper understanding into how your product behaves without wavering in its value or, or you know, going tangentially and creating other things. So you know, I'd, I'd like this to be interactive. I'm, if there are entrepreneurs out there, what are you building? What are you thinking? What are your fears? What do you find problematic? Why are you in healthcare? Um, counseling is available after this, but uh, you know, it's, it's it's those things I'm, I'm more than happy to discuss. So, hands up, questions, discussions, uh, push back on anything that I've said. Uh, who's built a company here out of the entrepreneurs? So, what have you done? Sure. Uh, I'm co-founder at a company called Smart Chemo, and we make a product which helps uh, write pediatric oncology orders. Uh, right now, it's very, very complex. It's all very manual. We built a system where uh, you can break it down into templates, use those templates to then create order sets. Um, He's been around for about three years now. Um, our biggest hurdle is, kind of hoping that, is uh, being like the small guy and not having yeah. kind of the reputation. Everybody always looks at it as like, you know, who are your clients? Who are you working with? And that kind of thing. And we've been building up slowly but surely. But is there a way to kind of like shortcut that or accelerate that? Or, you know, how do you go from being an unknown with a, the, the, in our case, the need exists in the market, yeah. you know, but getting through kind of administration and those channels, being also software as a service is a little bit tough. Like, we have a lot of, of, of a bit of an uphill battle. So, uh, yeah, actually, there's a couple of things you bring in there. I mean, we're all experiencing the same thing. So I'm in a similar position as you are is uh, the first thing is who's your customer before I answer the you know, validation piece is b to b to c right? So you're going to sell to somebody who's selling to your customer. Uh, I was talking to, to Sam on the way up. This, this is kind of one of those things I look at and say, OK, this, there's something wrong here where the person that's servicing the consumer that you're going after has no real insight or incentive to go out and solve that problem. This is a huge problem. And in healthcare, uh, it's just all that more problematic because it's bureaucratic. And so if you were to create a solution in a rationally economic environment, uh, this would make total sense if you brought cost efficiency, if you brought productivity, if you brought all the rest of it. Uh, but in healthcare, it doesn't work that way. And the reason is, is that the infrastructure, the bureaucracy is set up to uh, layer in uh, departmental needs. And so not everyone is equal within healthcare. So pediatric oncology is not equal to, and I can give you the list, probably give you the ranking of where you land on that list. Um, but as a result of that, it becomes complex to convince administration to actually adopt something. And so this is where you need to go out and find outside of, you know, or inside of large institutions that individual that can latch onto it who has credibility. I can't be even at PingMD, I can't be an IBM, I can't be a Cisco, I can't be a Microsoft. I can't be these big entities. Could I partner with them? I could, but they're not willing to do that. And funnily enough, you talk to them, they don't have channel relationships. They're not very good distribution partners. Uh, they want you to do the heavy work because why? They can't sell to physicians in hospitals either. And so, you know, it's, I think that the entrepreneur now has to come up with a new model. And so one of the things I find in, particularly given you're given a, an IT solution, is a new model for distribution is being created. We just cannot go through the CIO. Is the CIO of NYU Medical here, by the way? I just want to make sure. <laughs> um, the, you, the CIO's job is implementation. 
and their biggest pain point is they've got a thousand, a hundred, or ten physicians, whatever the size institution, uh, saying, I've got 20 systems, 10, a dozen, it doesn't matter. I, if I've got more than one system, I can't use it. I don't have the time. I've got a family. I've got my own life. Let me lead it. And so I think that's, that's a very valid issue. Uh, so how do you bring something like this to be is to really find a champion um, middle customer, that B2B. You've got to find somebody that can scale. There are really good examples of, of pharmaceutical companies doing this. Uh, there are very good examples of payers doing this. And another thing in healthcare IT is because we've not done this often enough, we're all trying multiple avenues. You've got a parallel. You can't just be at one institution or have one relationship. Currently at PingMD, I mean, we have probably a dozen running at the same time. Same product, same platform, same customer, end customer. Different business proposition in the middle. So, you know, it, it, I, I feel the pain, but it's kind of a, I'm not IBM and I need to scale. How do I get there? Who else has got a company out there that would like to share? So. I'm just curious, along that line, um, is it uh, possible to use, uh, for lack of a better term, a crowdsourcing approach of physicians who might respond to that uh, solution, the physicians that were in that sector? Yeah. You'd have to reach out through the social media approach to gather that kind of a conversation, but then you've got an opportunity to build early adopter support and find those guys who would reach out and embrace that solution. Have you tried that? Yeah, it's, and um, it's, it's not all that, it's, it's very... But what's the uphill? I have, I've got any, I, we actually did this too. I mean, we're pediatric focused at PingMD. What we found is, the, and the doctors and the physicians that use our software love it or they've seen it, but then running up the chain, it basically, it, it's specific in ours because there's these big EHR systems that the hospitals use, they feel that the EHRs can solve every problem and by bringing in a s small point that it actually kind of undermines the EHR in this case. So even though all the physicians and everything love it, when it gets up to administration, basically it, it stops working. There, there's a huge excitement around social media and its application as sale and distribution in healthcare, again, I, I don't see it yet. Um, we see it in, in a lot of consumer realm, but in healthcare, crowdsourcing, getting uh, multiple physicians on one platform as a discussion, I found two main issues. One, clearly, you know, they're not the decision maker. And so you end up with one or two, but they don't end up being decision maker. They may adopt it for a while, but they can't institute or implement that as a solution for business. As a business, you don't have the time. You've really got to make inroads into a consumer that will purchase. Uh, the second that we find is, and I say this to colleagues, uh, um, as fellows is that you put two doctors in a room, or you put 20, you count crowdsource 100, the opinions, you end up exposing your product to opinions that don't really exist. Uh, we're very good at, um, you know, where the one-upmanship. We know better, we know how to do this, this is where it doesn't work. And so you don't end up fine-tuning an innovation. Through all the years of working with physicians, I can tell you the easiest thing to build it hand it to them and tell them it works. If you start to figure it out with them, uh, you'll just run into wall after wall. And you'll end up, what's the story of the, the kid carries the donkey and then eventually the uncle carries it and the whole thing. You can't please everyone. So it's not, an, it's not a very encouraging and accelerating or viral environment to go out there. It's just personal experience. I mean, we're yet to see something like that. Uh, it happens in consumer, but, but not with inside a professional group. Who else is building a company here? There's a lot of entrepreneurs here. Uh, yeah, I have a startup called Medtel.com. We, we're building, it's uh, search and communication tools between physicians and more so office managers and medical device uh, sales reps and pharma sales reps. Okay. And coming from financial services, working with international emerging markets, and everything sort of streamlining more uniform, it's find a much big disconnect, especially in, in the medical device space, and trying to get better data so help physicians and office managers find the right products and right. communicate easily. Um, 
And when you say data, you mean? Um, well, data it, it, on, on products decision that relate to conditions and procedures. Right. And, and not just therapy areas, and you know, which I'm working on building some algos that sort of can help. It's interesting. So, we, I mean, a lot of the themes here are healthcare IT. Um, healthcare IT, I find uh, we're in a different realm right now. We just, pharmaceutical devices, et cetera, it was all about clinical trials, it's about clinical data, it's about outcome. Those things almost seemed easier to do than what we are faced with right now. Um, the problem with that is cost, time, acquisition of customer and client, sorry, uh, and understanding the data and analyzing it to influence a decision. But our decision influence that we're trying to create right now is the information officer, the chief medical information officer, all those titles that carry health tech. And I find the data burden is really kind of confused. We don't have metrics. We're not clear about uh, what the decision process is. So we can't deliver data to convince people. Uh, data is usually about how do I enter the decision process tree where I ultimately lead to a purchase. Uh, and it's not clear to me in healthcare IT that that currently exists. And so I find you know, a lot of us just, we, we are actually trying to get around collecting the data because no one's defined it for us. Uh, it's, it's an interesting realm right now. But you know, an example of adoption for us, what was really exciting was, um, and I use uh, examples of um, minimally invasive, take cholecystectomy, the big reason why we shifted the market big reason why everyone decided they needed to be a laparoscopic surgeon was threat, was a revenue threat, is physicians respond quickly when the customer base moves. Now, ultimately, you're going to split them, you know, you're cardiothoracic versus interventional cardiologist, uh, and one dinosaur dies and the other dinosaur survives. They're both dinosaurs, by the way. Um, but the... The fact is that you're, you're trying to uh, assimilate data to make, um, so you're, you're trying to create a solution that creates a threat in the market that causes a behavioral shift. Uh, behavioral shifts are really complicated in healthcare, and I've, I've seen a few. The other one is um, to be able to house a technology in arena that has an indirect effect of a threat, where, uh, and robotics is the perfect example, we actually put a robotic system in, you create a halo. And now you get it, you become a catchment and referral point. Can you do that with technology is an interesting place. So we as PingMD actually make uh, exclusivity arrangements so that you can only access certain doctors in a certain region. We create a visible threat so that you can ch start to channel volume and, and create, um, create enough data to convince everybody else that this is a valid solution. So. Using instruments and ideas, uh, it's still very ideation phase. Uh, we haven't yet, I've not yet seen a, a healthcare IT company perfectly articulate uh, a, a rapid adoption pathway, whether it's viral or it's you know, through data, through education. Uh, it's not a simple market to educate because we still don't know where in those tiers uh, we're targeting for a decision that says, oh yeah, we love your system, here's a check we'll install it tomorrow. Um, that process doesn't exist right now. 